Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got loads, including a crazy light German power meter, no more yellow Mavic cars in the Tour de France, an e-bike powered by the sun, and our main talking point, which is tech from the 80s. Right, our poll from last week was, what should we do to beat Sai and stop me getting dropped? Yeah. Um, and well, well, the answers were a less technical, more efficient course and a more efficient teamwork, an aero bike uh, for me, or try five riders or just give up, it's not possible. Well, thankfully, people are saying that if we work more efficiently as a team, 40% of the people said that was the best way and they reckon we, that's what we need to do. Okay. Only 15% of people think it's not possible. Well, I'm, pleased, I'm well. pleased to hear that. People have got a lot of faith in you. Especially as we can do more than one of those things. We, we can, can do, also we can do get an aero bike. 23% of people said that. Well, I think we can do it. I definitely think we can do it. If, if you guys ride better as a team. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> right. On to our main talking point, which is tech from the 80s. And the, the 80s has given us some great things. It's a good decade. It's given us the Sony Walkman, the Apple Macintosh computer. Ollie was even built in the 80s. But what about cycling tech? What has the 80s given us for that? Do you know what, I think I'll start us off with, uh, with, a, with a humble clipless pedal, I think. A piece of tech that most people take for granted these days. Yeah. But, you know, the first half of the 80s didn't exist, did it? <laughs> people were still riding around in like toe straps, like strapping their feet in. Yeah, that's very weird, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Look is, is the company often credited with the creation of the, of the clipless pedal um, in 1984. But, you know, cyclists, like we know it now with disc brakes, you know, they're, they're often reluctant for change and they didn't take picky. off initially. Slow uptake, but you know, when the likes of you know, Eno and uh, Le Monde started winning using the clipless pedals, um, yeah. The, yeah, everyone. It was a good year them. until they sort of picked up any traction and people started to really sort of buy into the idea of clipless pedals. Yeah. Very good. And up next is Francesco Moser's Owl record from 1984. Um, and he took a radical new approach to what Eddie Merckx had taken because he had held the Owl record for the previous 12 years. Whereas Merckx had focused on lightweight, Francesco Moser and his team of engineers focused on aerodynamics. And it was pretty cutting edge at the time because it wasn't something anyone else was doing. And he was one of the first riders to use a double lenticular disc wheel on his bike, yeah. as well as a host of other um, technical developments around aerodynamics. He also used a skin suit, which is quite yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's a well, low pro design as well, yeah. so you get lower at the front end. Yeah. And I think the thing that, that really is interesting is that, that Moser's bike was almost twice the weight oh, yeah, of Eddie Merckx's bike. Like the wheels alone, were like five kilograms, which is like the weight of his bike. But although they were heavier, they're far more aero. And it was that appreciation of aero over weight, especially in something like the, the hour record. And once they got up to speed, they acted like giant flywheels anyway, storing that energy. So it wasn't really, a, wasn't really an issue. But I mean, that record was, was impressive. 51.151 kilometers stood for, well, well into the 90s. It's pretty impressive, isn't mm. it? And as you can see on his disc wheels, there is an Enovit logo actually, because Enovit actually sort of improved sports nutrition in the 80s. Previously, it didn't really exist, and you could see riders having steaks for breakfast, which yeah. is a little bit weird by today's standards. Yeah. But Enovit launched some of their new products in the 80s. Mm. And it wasn't just like, well, I mean, like Aero uh, um, in, in Moses' record. The 80s, you know, really was the decade where the Aero revolution started to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't just Moses' hour record, but also, you know, things like the, the 1989 Tour de France. Um, for those who, who weren't around then, um, you know, you have Laurent Fignon, he's 50 seconds ahead of Greg LeMond on GC in the final stage of his time trial. LeMond goes on to win by eight seconds. Oh, well, spoiler alert here. I think that's it. I think enough time has passed me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and that was, you know, put down to, to using tri bars in, in that time trial. So LeMond used them, Fignon didn't. And um, it has been calculated that the, the aerodynamic advantage of tri bars made the difference that yeah. day. Not unsurprisingly now, but back then they'd have been surprised by that. Interestingly enough, though, that tri bar design was designed by a guy called Boone Lennon, who was a former US national ski team coach. 
and um, it would appear skiers had a far greater appreciation of aerodynamics than cyclists at the time. Yeah, well, the, the tri-bar position idea came from like the tuck that skiers adopt when, when you know, they're going downhill. And we kind of owe a lot to skiing when we think about it, because you, know, you look at Look and their pedals, their clipless pedal idea came from their ski binding tech. And also, well, skin suits as well were being used by downhill skiers way before it was a thing in yeah, inside. Yeah, interesting. But how did those pesky UCI judges allow the tri-bars to be used, especially with their great big book of rules? Well, it's, it's quite a cool story. So apparently, the, the team wanted to use the tri-bars and they sneakily took them to see the UCI judges the day before the time trial because they didn't want any of the other teams to see that's what they were, they were planning to use. And the chief judge apparently was like, yeah, okay, Greg Lamont can use it. But they, the, the team were expecting that um, so they were going to say no. Them. So yeah. even before like he said, yeah, you can use it, they were ready with their next line, which was, he needs to use them because he's got a back problem, his back's hurting, so he needs to use these special handlebars. And apparently the judge was like, no, no, you didn't listen to me. I said it's okay, you can use them. Get out of my sight before I change my mind. And like they went off, used them, and then he obviously smashed it and won. That's what it just, is impressive, isn't it? I know, but imagine, yeah. I mean, that UCI judge must have been in a good debt, like, you know, good mood that day. Yeah. I mean, imagine if that one moment, if that judge had just got out of the wrong side of bed, like they normally do, and then had just gone, no, you having a laugh, no. Then no we, way would you get away without these We would have never would have had tri bars. We would have never have gone aero. We could just be still, like, you know, that whole thing could have, like, that, could, that was the, the catalytic butterfly effect moment there. <laughs> all, from one, all from one loose conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 80s also saw riders start to switch what their cycling clothing was made from. Previously, they'd used materials such as wool and cotton, and they actually started to use synthetic man-made fibres, which meant the cycling kit could be far more closer fitting and aerodynamic. It also saw the rise of sublimation printing, which is why we've seen some of the fast or garish designs that we'd not previously seen. Yeah, I think, um, well, Castelli famously did a, a big sort of marketing stunt where they sent riders to the Giro d'Italia with pink Lycra shorts, and they all got fined for not wearing black shorts, but it was a great marketing sort of yeah. showing off <laughs> cool. the, the new Lycra shorts and stuff, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, in terms of bikes, you know, steel was still the dominant material. Yeah. Aluminium and carbon bikes weren't very common, but they were starting to appear. So we had the, the Look KG86, um, which actually was the bike ridden to victory in the 1986 Tour, Tour de France. France yeah. Carbon tubes bonded into aluminium lugs. I've ridden it, actually, one of those bikes. That's um, cool. <laughs> well, it, it was very cool, but it was a bit rubbish, if I'm honest. Um, although I think that was because it was a bit flexy and the uh, bonding because it was so old, the bonding was starting to fail a bit in between where, <laughs> yeah. where it could join in the lugs. There you go. Yeah. The key advantage at the time, though, with the KG86, was that it was about a kilogram lighter than the equivalent steel bikes that the competition were using, which yeah, is impressive, impressive, isn't it? Yeah, it is impressive. And the 80s also gave us the first commercially available full carbon fibre bike, which was the Kestrel 4000, which is pretty impressive, isn't it? Mm. Oh, Kestrel. Yeah, considering most brands were still using pre-shaped carbon fibre tubes with a lugged design, this was pretty radical in its design. Yeah, monocoque. Very good. The 80s gave us good aluminium bikes as well, the most notable of which uh, is the Vitus 979, as ridden by Sean Kelly, who won a shed load of races on it. And I say good because aluminium bikes did exist prior to the 80s. You know, even in the late 60s, uh, people were experimenting with aluminium bikes. Jacques Oncatil tried out aluminium bikes on a few occasions. Impressive. But they were rubbish. I mean, they were all just really flexy and weren't up to the task, and so they never took off. And it wasn't until Vitas came along with the 979, and they used a special alloy of aluminium in it called Dural 979 and that was sufficiently stiff so they could actually make a proper good race bike on it. That is pretty cool, and the yeah. finish on some of these bikes is pretty impressive. That anodized finish is it's very beautiful, cool. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that actually because we've managed to track down one of these bikes and coming up soon is a pro retro bike feature on this, which is very cool. On that, yeah, on the Vitus 970. Yeah. Well, we want to know what is your favourite 80s cycling tech creation. So we've created a poll over in the GCN app. So head over and vote and let us know. We'll discuss that next week. Yeah, let us know in the comments down below as well. Do you love indoor training, but struggle with where you put your, your laptop, your tablet or your mobile phone? I mean, I certainly do. I, I find myself like constructing like makeshift furniture out of cardboard boxes so I can kind of get the laptop into the right height 
kind of near where I'm. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's away. interesting. But also, when I find when I'm doing Zwift, how on earth do people manage to type when they're on Zwift? Because I can't type. I'm I'm doing my efforts. I'm doing my riding. I mean, I can't even reach the keyboard for starters. But there's no way I could type a sentence out. No. How on earth do people I'm just do a it? Sweaty mess. <laughs> just a str I can't think of typing. Anyway, if yeah. this sounds familiar, and his new gadget from Indoor Velo could be for you. It's said to fit to 99.9% .9 of handlebars. Sorry if you're in the point. 1%, but it should have most people covered. Um, and it attaches onto your handlebars using these very quick and easy toggle clamps that then secure it so that it can hold your smartphone and also a tablet or a laptop right where you want it in front of you. But it's very quick and simple to fit and remove. But it's also said to be very secure, so your devices aren't going to accidentally knock off and, and get damaged. I think it's a very neat design. Yeah, pretty cool, actually. And up next, we've got a big change here. No more yellow Mavic cars in the Tour de France. Yeah, big news this. The end of an era. I mean, those yellow Mavic neutral service cars have, have been quite a sort of iconic sight in the very much, Tour yeah. de France peloton. Um, but no longer. They're being replaced by Shimano. Um, as they're now going to be providing neutral service at ASO races. ASO, one of the biggest organisers of bike races in the world. They do things like the Tour de France, but also, um, well, Flèche Vallon, Paris Nice, Paris Roubaix, Paris -Roubaix Liège, Baston Liège. All the big ones. All the big ones, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is the massive races. And, um, well, I think this is really interesting. We're going to see blue cars with Shimano on them. It is a big change, isn't it? And interestingly, mm. it does, well, we were just talking about it, wonder how they're going to deal with a crossover with Campag with some other teams. Yeah, I, mean, I wonder if they're going to have any Campag equipped wheels on the car because on the Campagnolo rotors on their disc brakes, the rotors are slightly narrower gauge than, than the Shimano rotor. They're slightly thicker. Yeah. So if you were to put a Shimano rotor in a Campag bike, the, the rotor might rub because it's not it's not designed for that gap, so oh, it'll be interesting to see what yeah, happens with that. Be, yeah. but I guess we'll, we'll, well, if you want to watch and find out, you can watch those races on, on Race Pass. We uh, should have rights to them. Perfect. Territory restriction to apply. And up next, we've got the world's lightest power meter. An exotic German carbon part manufacturer, THM, have teamed up with Sensitivus Gauge um, to make the world's lightest power meter. Yeah, it's called the Clavicular SE Road Power Meter, and it's said to weigh just 320 grams in the compact version. I think 329 grams for the standard yeah. uh, version. It's only a little bit heavier. Um, and that's without chain rings, but it is ridiculously light. It's very light. And the, the Sensitivus power meter itself is said to weigh just 27 grams. So, you know, very, very, very light very power light. meter. But not the lightest power meter, as I'm sure many of you are screaming. Uh, Four Eyes little power meter pod that they fit to cranks. Um, it's only nine grams. So that is lighter, but that's not available on these THM cranks. So I think that the crank with this Sensitivus like power combined, meter combined weight yeah. Is, is probably the, the lightest out oh, there. Oh, it is, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's very light. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can imagine, it's not very cheap. 1,975 <laughs> euros this is, so yeah. you better get saving up. Yeah, yeah. Better, better do a few more paper rounds. Yeah. Speaking of paper rounds, right, check this out. Okay, so this is the Schwinn Classic Cruiser, and it's a retro-designed bike, um, which is a very beautiful bike, but in the form of a spin bike, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it has all the, the typical features of a spin bike, but a few cool extras yeah. as well. Yeah, so it's got an analog speedo, and looking at the pictures, it appears that it has a bell on it for authenticity, but I think I might be getting that wrong, because surely yeah. it doesn't have a bell. But it's also got a smartphone and laptop, laptop and tablet holder incorporated onto the handlebars with um, a virtual world app that you can use and ride in, which means, according to this, it says you can ride along and deliver newspapers on your ride, should you ever wish to do that. like a virtual paper app. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Um, FYI though, right? Yeah. Second hardest game ever on Sega Mega Drive, right? Go on. Paperboy. <laughs> oh, so hard. Uh, so if that's the second artist, what's, what's the first one? Echo the Dolphin. Oh, no doubt about it there, was there? <laughs> and up next, we've got some pretty cool glasses. These are the Jolbo Evade Ones. And these are pretty sleek design and feature a built-in heads-up display on them, which is pretty impressive. And we've seen this kind of technology and glasses like this before, but these have just been awarded an innovation award at the um, Virtual Consumer Electronics Show, which is pretty cool, actually. Got some interesting features on these. 12-hour um, battery life. Uh, fame, um, 
integrated touchscreen panel on the top of the glasses to switch across the displays. It display your speed, your heart rate, your distance, but interestingly enough, at the moment, it won't display any power meter information, which mm. for cyclists is a bit of a letdown, really. It uses Bluetooth technology, but they have hinted that this could be added. Yeah, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see how these glasses progress. We have seen products like this in the past, but they've all kind of struggled. Yeah. Um, and, and this has generally been because the tech hasn't quite been there yet and the glasses have often been quite bulky. Yeah. And you think of examples like Oakley's Radar Pace or Recon Jet or the Raptor Every Sight, which Lloydy tried out a few years ago. And although they are you know, very cool, um, they have struggled being bulky, like I say, these look to have solved that issue. They look to be very sleek and compact. So I'm, yeah, I'm certainly gonna keep a close eye on them and see, yeah. see if they take off. And finally, in hot tech this week, we've got an e-bike that's powered by solar panels, so the sun, which is pretty impressive. And this is a project I spotted over on Kickstarter, and it's designed for emerging markets in Africa. And they've got two working examples, and their aim is to fund enough to get 300 bikes across to there. Um, so this works in a bit of a tandem design, really, when you look at it. And presumably, it's that design to enable it to hold the large solar panel that it needs to charge the big batteries which sit in the housing. Yeah, but yeah. also transport either people or things Yeah, uh, if, if it's required. So that's two 250 watt motors on there. And I just think anything that helps people with transportation in developing countries mm. in an you know, eco-friendly way, I'm, I'm just all for it. It's the, I'm very much for it. And it's the first yeah. time I've seen an e-bike that is charged by the sun. Yeah. Well, very cool. You wouldn't be able to do that here, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> More hot tech next week. Time now for snacks of the week. What have we got? Well, hold fire. We have got, I should have given you a packet as well, yeah, actually. Yeah. We've got beef jerky sent in by a very kind guy. He's actually also sent in, one second. Oh. Just in case, covered all dietary requirements. Veggie jerky, just in oh, case. Hank and his vegan challenge. Mine, Wagyu, Wagyu beef jerky. That's yeah, I've got, I've got honey barbecue. But interestingly enough, clever sort of move here by this guy. Stuart Tipplestone is the kind person to send this in. And he's not given us any other information other than kindly included his business card in here for us. <laughs> Which is shows he's a photographer. Yeah, available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals. Yeah. Um, Chris News. <laughs> so maybe this could be a, a new turn for snacks of the week. People sending in, like bribing us with little snacks and yeah. just including their business cards. How in. do you rate um, beef jerky as a riding snack? Maybe a little bit dry for the bike. Although you I could think just... if I was doing some big endurance challenge and I wanted some protein, that's a good way to have protein. Actually, that's a good point. And it doesn't need to be refrigerated. Well, just built on, stick this in your pocket. Which is basically beef jerky now, built on. Yeah. The Maasai use that when they travel around hunting. They have, they have it, that's where it comes from. Well, I mean, if it's good for them, it's good for our bike rides. Hopefully more snacks next week. I'm hoping for a um, afternoon tea set. I'm giving, I'm giving this five, five out of 10 bike snack rating. I don't want to review it just yet. I'll hold fire. Okay. Hmm. Now time for screw riding upgrades by upgrades. upgrades. Where you submit evidence of the upgrades that you've made to your bike's equipment or cycling lives for the chance to win the ultimate prize. A oh, GCN water bottle. Say it a bit more enthusiastic. A than GCN that, like. water bottle. Oh, it's a good, you've got to sell it. Yeah. Anyway, first we need to see who won last week. And as ever, you can submit your upgrades using the GCN app. Um, so last week we had Mark Bayer and his custom painted Scott Cyclocross gravel mashup versus Adrian Fleiss's Cervelo TT P1. Inspired, inspired by, you. by me. So guess which one I voted for. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the P1 didn't win, man. It wasn't enough. Unfortunately, not. No. And Mark Bayer has won uh, with his gravel mashup. That brilliant. Uh, it was a great bike, to be fair. 53% yeah. of the vote. Get in contact on Facebook. And we'll get uh, the GCM water bottle out to you. Who have we got this week, Alex? This week, first up, we've got Jameson Dietrich, um, who's got a 1985 Team USA Rally road bike, which he bought for $60. Stripped it all down, cleaned it, re-greased everything, put it all back together with some upgrades. It's kept his old chain rings, brakes, derailleur, um, converted it from downtube down shifters with um, new 105 shifters. Yeah, group set of the people. 
The creeps other people. Oh, yeah, it's on that. I mean, um, this bike's got, for me, like a real kind of uh, breaking away vibe going onto it. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you probably, you've not seen breaking away, have you? No. We need to, we need to sort that out. We'll sort that out. Okay. But it is cool. I can't help but think the um, I method, think wicked. The method of his photos have been upgraded as well. We've got a very dark room for the first one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a stunning bike. I yeah, it's, it's really, a really cool. Really, really cool bike. A shame um, we haven't got any more sort of build pictures throughout the throughout the build. But I it's used to cool. live in the rally factory where that was probably made. Um, I, not actual in factory. It? Well, in the, the factory. Yeah, well, the factory has now been converted into flats in Nottingham, and oh. I used to live there when I was a student. Well, that's actually really cool. Yeah, nice. And, uh, it's not going to be plain sailing though, because Jameson Dietrich is up against Matt C. Padstow who uh, finally finished upgrading his Pinarello GAN. And this is pretty nice, right? So he stripped it back, he's fitted new um, Ultegra components, but also some Dura Ace bits, a front max Dura Ace, stages power meter uh, on the crank, and he's put all new cables, housing, rotors, and put some pin, uh, Pirelli Cinturatos. Good choice of tire, yeah, I like, like those tires, yeah. don't you? Yeah. Um, and he's serviced it, put new bar tape on, and then he's put, right, Carbon bladed mud guards on or fenders um, for the UK wet weather. What do you make of that? Pretty cool, actually. For a winter bike, that is very cool. Yeah, I've also spotted he's got a, a rather slick looking canyon. Um, Ultimate. Ultimate yeah. hiding in the background there. He's got a few bikes by the look of things. He's got some good equipment here. He's got his big park tool stand in the back. Guys, yeah, very That's good. That's a really nice bike, though, that GAN, isn't it? Good colour for a winter bike, actually. I'd I mean, point... as winter bikes go, that's 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 like better than most people's like all the time bike. It's a very good bike. That is like a, a seriously pimped winter bike. Winter bike colour, because I pointed this out um, last week, I think it was. Somebody else's winter bike was black, and I suggested it wasn't the greatest colour for a winter bike. So, mm. orange, good choice. Yeah, I like that. Black does hide the dirt, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is. Uh, is I'm going to be interested to see the results of this one next yeah, week. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. call that. Very nice. Both very good upgrades, both in the poll. Time now for our favourite part of the show, the Bike Vault, where you submit pictures of your bikes and we judge them to be either nice or super nice. What happens if they're super nice, Alex? If they're super nice... And they get committed to the vault forever. You can submit your bikes using the GCN app. And uh, you can also play along at home and uh, vote yourself in the app on all the bikes we feature if you disagree. Although we are always right. Yes, very true. Who have we got first? First up, we have got ZSK6F6SANY. Catchy name. Yeah, very catchy, rolled off the tongue. This is their Orbea M30 2020. Again, orange colour. Bit of yeah. an orange bike theme this week. I do like, I do like orange. I do like orange bikes, you know. Mm. Big, big uh, yeah. I'm not sure I'd buy one, but I always think oh, they look good. Yeah, they um, look cool. Very cool bike, actually. Yeah. This is a bike we have here that we quite use for some maintenance videos. Yeah, it's but quite like our one, yeah. isn't it? But we've got wheels and tyres not aligned, cranks aligned, but we're not in biggie smalls here. I think here, that's, the, that's the deal breaker. And yeah. also the, the Mavic with the little yellow bits on the wheels, mm. they really highlight that the wheels aren't in the same orientation. Mm. So it's not a positive, it's not a good start, is it? This week, I think week? it's a nice, you know. Yeah. Next, we've got Lung Quan, who uh, has his Boardman comp. Um, what do you make of that? Cool, good actually. background, like yeah. nice industrial sort of venting at the bottom of a building. Yeah. <laughs> nice slats. Um, sleek, sleek looking bike, actually. Nice black, subtle logos. Um, smart and tidy. That old, that's the original Boardman bikes logo. I prefer it to the new logo. The current logo, I don't think it's as good. That original Boardman logo with the CB thing. Yeah, I think that is cool. It's like what the Brownleys won the Olympics on. Bikes that looked like that. That is cool, isn't it? It is cool, yeah. Um, but this is, there's been a lot of thought and preparation gone into this um, submission, so thanks for that, because we've got wheels lined up, tyres lined up, we've got Biggie Smalls, cranks level, no accessories, no chimney, saddles level. I can't I like, fault this. Nah, I think they're good bikes. They came, they were a bargain as well when they came out. I remember the price of them. And um, you could get those bikes for like a really good price with good SRAM components on them and the Richie finishing kit and wheels. Very yeah, good. I think they're just a cool, I think they're a classic. I'm going to call it early. Super yeah, nice for me. Super nice. Yeah. 
Um, good to see it's still going strong. Next now. up, we've got Joe Mendoza, 777. First ride in 2021, and yeah. it's his first road bike, Cervelo S3. Well, as first road bikes go. Oh, baby! That is one hell of a first road bike. That is amazing. Look at that. That is a really nice looking paint job on it as well. And he's he's done the, I mean, you've got the, everything, he's no chimney, the wheels aligned. Textbook, this is textbook, Alex. This is, this is impressive work. For his first road bike. He's also and, yeah. got good bike fault skills. I mean, one slight thing, we've got like one bottle in there. Maybe it, it would have been either like leave both in or have none in. Yeah. Would be my thing, but I can let that. That's a minor infraction. I'll definitely live with that. Super nice. Super nice all round. Easy. Makes our life easy. Yeah. Uh, Mel 101 um, has submitted his T Lab X3 gravel bike. What do you make of this? Cool colours, I like the colour. Oh yeah. That fade on Chrome the, blue. That fade on there. Well it's not a fade, is it? It's a it's a disconnect. But um <laughs> it does remind me of the, the fade that was on the blue to the silver and like the you know brushed silver. That is cool. On, yeah. Oh, I love that colour. Um I got a lot of time for that. I think that's Yeah, do you know uh, what? It's immaculately think... clean. I mean look at that cassette, you could eat your dinner off it. <laughs> look at that. We could eat all our snacks of the week off that. We could. Um, I'm gonna go. I, I'm happy with this. I like it. Oh, Super nice for me. Yeah. Super nice straight yeah, on. That is, a, that, is a, that is a beauty. Love Good. it. Good. Um, WMK two four four with their Kalkoff. Kalkoff Beast of Burden mm. twenty nineteen. So Kalkoff make e bikes. Is that an e bike? I can't tell. Uh, unless it has a rear hub motor, which it could do, but it's obscured by the oversized pannier bag. I, I once um, took the Kitzbühlerhorn KOM on a Karl Koff e-bike. Did you? Yeah. Interesting fact. I mean, I was totally upfront about it. I got flagged straight away. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see if it was possible years ago in the infancy of e-bikes. Um, so yeah, after a, a very good start to this week's Bike Vault, we've taken a bit of a dive here with preparations. Nothing against the bike itself. But the preparations here are very poor. I am trying to work out where this picture has been taken, and to my eye, that looks like a train station in England. It does look like a train station. Because yeah. they're the kind of seats that we get in train stations in England. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. Hmm. Um, England, that, not that renowned for its comfy That exact um, paint benches. job on the seats. I might be wrong, this could be Germany. Karl Koff bikes are, are German. Hmm. Maybe they have the same seats. Anyway, it's a nice. I mean, there's just. It's, uh, yeah, it's just a nice. That's our final um, bike vault submission this week. Oh, oh shame. shame to end on that one. Yeah. Hmm, sorry about that. Unfortunately, that's it for this week's GCN Tech Show. I hope you've enjoyed it. But don't forget to check out our new book. Yes, hot off the press. Finally got our hands on one. Uh, you know, we didn't have one last week. But if you're planning on doing any home maintenance yourself on your bikes, which you might, well, we would recommend you do, it yeah. saves you time and money, then we've intended this book to be the Bible for the home mechanic. So, yeah, make sure you check out. It's available in the GCN shop. Also, I've noticed there's some rather horrific pictures of me that keep cropping up. <laughs> Namely, there's this one where... I like the fact there's one of them's in there multiple times. Yeah, this one. Let's show that. Anyway, we'll see you next week. <laughs>